Welcome to the Broad Art Tell Me More Around the World web webinar. Today, two authors will be sharing their stories with us. Our moderator, Susie Holly, is a collection development librarian at Broad Art. Along with over 20 years in collection development with Broad Art specializing primarily in children's and young adult materials. Susie has been a school media specialist, a professor of children's literature, a Newberry committee member, and a co-author of children's literature textbook. Over to you, Susie. Hi, everybody, and welcome. We're so glad you could join us today. We have two remarkable authors with us. The first one we'll talk about is Michael Spradlin, and he actually is going to tell us about his book called The Rise of the Spider, which was published in September by Margaret Elderberry. It's the first in a series called The Web of the Spider. Now, Michael is has a very funny biography that you must read online. He's written over a dozen books, and his youth was spent reading hundreds of books and dreaming about sneaking fireworks over the border from Michigan and blowing up his collection of plastic green army men and matchbox cars. And Michael, I'm sorry to admit this, but my children must, my sons must be your age because <laughs> I know all about those green army men and matchbox cars. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a rite of, a rite of passage. Uh, for, <laughs> now, um, um, Michael is writing this wonderful, wonderful, compelling and very action packed book about Germany. And it takes place, I think, in 1929, doesn't it, Michael? Before, correct. Yep. Yeah. It really became a Nazi stronghold, but on its way. Uh, will you tell us about the book, please? Right. Um, <clears throat> the Rise of the Spider is the first book in a, in a series with the series named The Web of the Spider. Um, and the plan is for there to be six books in the series. Uh, each book will be a different year, 1929, 1930, 31, all the way up to 1934 when Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Um, and each book will be told from the point of view of a different character uh, in the story. So uh, the first book is about a young boy named Rolf, whose brother becomes sort of uh, enamored by the Hitler Youth when the Hitler Youth arrives in his town of Harrelsburg, Germany. And he watches as uh, what's happening in the country on this macro scale with Nazis beginning to make all of these inroads is happening on a micro scale right in his own family as his brother and his father come into conflict over the fact that uh, his brother Romer is, is really uh, starting to fall under the sway of, of Hitler's message. Uh, <clears throat> this idea sort of came to me. Uh, I, um, I actually went on a trip to Normandy uh, three years ago with my son. Um, we went and spent a week there and my there we went because my uncle my dad's brother was a a was killed in action on June 6 1944 on Omaha Beach and <clears throat> while i was over there and watching this um i <clears throat> we went to the american cemetery which is kind of above the beach on this bluff above the beach and it's this beautiful beautiful location it was a beautiful gorgeous summer day and in the cemetery, there were all these French school children, I would say, if I had to guess, probably third or fourth grade, who were going through the cemetery. Uh, they had been given uh, some type of uh, uh, assignment to go through the cemetery to different grave sites to find different soldiers who had been laid to rest and record, record them. And <clears throat> talking to our guide, I learned that... Um, the World War II and, and especially the, the Normandy liberation, as the French call it, uh, is something that uh, every school child in, in France studies uh, from age, uh, not only just as a matter, but is, is built into their curriculum uh, in age 13, uh, 15, and 17. And he told me that undoubtedly every French school child in the country has been, uh, it made at least one trip to the American cemetery uh, above the beach. And I, <clears throat> I thought of that and I was standing there and as I looked back on my trip, I thought about that moment and I looked out and I could see all of this beach 
be home and then massive scale of it really gets to you when you're there. And I said to myself, how did we get to this point? How, how on earth did we as human beings let this happen? How did we get to the point where we had these two massive armies, uh, a madman had become in charge of uh, an incredibly powerful country. And it took the combined might of three of our biggest nations on earth in order to uh, subdue and suppress this, this threat. And I thought, well, you know, that, that, that could be interesting. And as I dug into it a little bit, I realized, I think a lot of people realize that they are believe that Hitler uh, as a dictator just came in and just took power. Like he said, I'm the dictator, I'm in charge now, and I'm going to wipe out all of my enemies and I'm going to do whatever I want. And that's not how he did it. Uh, he did it through the ballot box. And he did it by getting Nazis and Nazi party officials elected to the German parliament. Every election, every federal election, there would be more Nazis and more Nazis and more Nazis until eventually they had the majority in parliament in 1933. Then they named him chancellor, basically that's like the president of, of the country. And he and they passed all these emergency actions that gave him dictatorial powers. And it was at that point that he began to purge uh, German society of his uh, political and ideological enemies. So this wasn't something that it was just the strong man who came in and, uh, and you know, like in, the, in a movie where a mafia don comes in and takes over a neighborhood. It is that help. Oh, damaged by the by World War One and so on its back economically and and every other way that people had no hope. And when someone comes along and offers a vision, offers hope, offers a change, offers a new direction, um, it's easy to be distracted by that sh that shiny thing. Um, and I, um, you know, it. it it was uh, a lot of research. Uh, I spent time in Germany, both in Haroldsburg, where the book is set. Haroldsburg mm -hmm. is a is a beautiful little bucolic city in in Bavaria, just outside of Nuremberg. Um, and I, um, again, like I said, I wanted to discover what it was that made all of this happen and brought us to that point, to where my uncle. Uh, and his comrades were climbing into their landing craft and storming the beach uh, at at Normandy in order to, as as President Roosevelt said, uh, to free a suffering humanity. And it, I I don't know. I get it, thinking about it even now still gives me chills um, to having been stood there and to watch and stand on the beach uh, within 200 yards of where my uncle's unit came ashore. Um, that was a really uh, compelling and, and moving experience. And I think it was certainly that experience that led me directly into the, into writing this, uh, this story. And, um, you know, like I said, there will be more books coming. The next book is Shred of the Spider that comes out next summer. Uh, and that will take place through the eyes of Ralph's best friend, Ansel, who is um, a bit of a Weisenheimer, a bit of a smart aleck. Uh, and he's going to have some interesting comments on on what he sees these uh, what he calls robots or automatons in the Hitler Youth uh, doing in his town. Uh, and so it was interesting to me to take this big geopolitical, social, economic, historical event and try to look at it through the eyes of someone 12, 13, 14 years old. And what did they think? How did, what did they think about it? How did it affect them? How did it affect their families? And I think that's what 
the uh, I think that's what the series is going to try to uh, reveal as it goes along. You were certainly successful in this one. And I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to tell just a little uh, personal story about Normandy. I think that was the most uh, amazing trip I ever took. And I happened to be uh, with some others, but my oldest son was with us and his wife. And his wife wasn't very fond of the military, although we're a military family. And Pete had actually been an army ranger. And so we stood on that cliff above where all the rangers climbed up. Right. Point you I, yep. I started to say something to Pete and I looked over at him and this great big tough guy had tears just rolling down his cheeks. Yep. Yep. But later my sis my daughter-in-law said, well, now I can see how important the military what a, what an important role it plays because we could be speaking German now. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, I I wish that every American that has the means and the ability to go there would go there. Um, and I think the fact that my, as my guide said, how ingrained in French school children, the story of this sacrifice is and how they understand it and learn about it. I don't think it's the same over here. I think, you know, students study World War II for sure, but I don't think they understand the depth of what it took to, uh, to achieve this victory. Uh, this liberation uh, of a of a continent, right. and you when you're there, you you're just overwhelmed by the scale and the and the uh, it just it just it's I like I said I I don't think I'll ever be over it, and I hope to go back someday. Yeah, me too. Same. I mean, it's really incredible. After you wrote it, um, after you wrote your book, you have an afterword, and it said um, it's common for us who live in democracies around the world to say it can't happen here, but it can. Right. I, I think, you know, the parallels in your story um, sure. with what are going on right now. Are right. Pretty <clears throat> and then, you know, one of the things I, I discovered doing research for this, when Hitler, way back in 1923, before the events of this book, he, he attempted to take over the Bavarian government, uh, the German German government is uh, uh, laid out in states, kind of like we have, and one of those states is Bavaria. And he tried to seize power in Bavaria by by violence, by uh, overthrowing the Bavarian state government. And there was a big riot. A lot of people were, uh, four police officers were killed, dozens were wounded, uh, and he was put on trial for treason. Mm. And the three judges that adjudicated his case were all Nazi party members and they did not want to convict him or they wanted to acquit him, but they realized, well, people died. We can't really acquit him. So they sentenced him to 10 years for treason instead of in most countries, treason is punishable by death. And he was released in nine months for good behavior. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Uh, and so it just shows how this starts, you know, it starts, it doesn't necessarily start, with a big, huge move at the top, it's it's insidious. And it, it, it here were three local judges that their decision changed the course of history of the world. And that's that's why, you know, there's a saying that gets attributed to a lot of different people, but eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And that means that we always have to watch and always have to pay attention to what is happening with our elected officials, both at a national and a local level. I mean, because it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. And and by the way, everyone, you can actually hear Michael read the first chapter of his book on Road Art's website. And also there's a YouTube. If you look it up, you can hear that first chapter. Um, now let's move on to Sherry. Sherry Green lives in... Uh, uh, Vancouver, BC, and she's probably pretty happy after what we've just been going through here. Um, she spent months and months researching this wonderful book she wrote called Song of Freedom, Song of Dreams. It's a novel in verse for ages 12 to 19, and it was published uh, in March by Andrews McNeil. Um, 
This book actually has been chosen as a finalist for the Governor General's Literature Award, and the winners are going to be announced November 13th. That's quite an honor. And now we'll be looking on November 13th to see what happens. We hope this one gets it. Um, she actually loves music. She's a poet and a musician, and she's a former nurse. She loves the outdoors and nature and does lots of uh, uh, walking around on the beaches and in the forests around her home. She also wrote a story about Germany and hers is a young woman is the protagonist in her book, a young woman named Helena and hers is about East Germany in 1989. And it's something that I was fairly unfamiliar with. So it was really great to read the book and find out what happened during that time. I honestly, it's about when the Berlin Wall or going moving up to when the Berlin Wall falls. And the only thing I know about that is Reagan saying, uh, take down the wall, Mr. Gorbachev. And so I looked it up to see that it he actually said that after the wall was opened up. But thanks, Sherry, for writing this book. And will you please tell us all about your book? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Um, yeah, Song of Freedom, Song of Dreams is um, it's my sixth book, but it is my first historical. And, you know, I loved the research so much that I suspect it will not be my last historical. <laughs> um, yeah, I found it so captivating because, like you say, we we know some of the history from the news or from, you know, if we were in school at the time. But how much do we actually know? And and I realized very little, actually, is how much I knew. Um, so I found it absolutely captivating learning about this. Um, so the book is set in the city of Leipzig in East Germany, uh, 1989, as you said, Susie, just before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that main character, Helena, um, she is fictional. Um, but the histor historic backdrop, all the political events, um, all real and Pretty much everything that happens in uh, the character's life and along the plot line is all inspired by um, real stories, real events as well. So uh, Helena is 16. She is a musician, um, a classical pianist. And for her, music is life. It is uh, how she explores and expresses her emotions. It's her refuge. It's her renewal. It's her strength. And in that regard, um, Helena is, you know, basically me. <laughs> um, but Helena dreams of life shaped by music and travel. She has uh, this this dream to go to musical landmarks around the world and um, to make a life in music. But under the very oppressive regime of the time, um, dreams and dreamers are not tolerated. And there's a, a huge network of informants um, who... Uh, will make pretty sure that any dissident speech, any dissident actions will find their way uh, to report it to the Stasi, the secret police. Um, and that means that Helena's life and her relationships are very much complicated by um, the need for suspicion of not knowing whom you can trust. Um, so 1989, uh, the fall, we had just had a startup again after a summer break of what was called the Monday Peace Prayer. So at the St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig, they would meet every Monday um, and pray for change, for peaceful change. And um, yeah, people gathered to pray, but it was also very much um, a safe space in this place and time where, you know, everyone was watching and listening. Um, it was a safe space where people uh, of like mind could discuss subjects and ideas um, that they didn't dare talk about anywhere else. So we had these weekly prayer meetings going on. And meanwhile, there were weekly demonstrations that would follow these peace prayers. So, uh, you know, the people would gather in the church and outside the church, uh, other citizens would gather and wait. And then the people would emerge from the meeting and you would have this blending of of the prayers and the songs and the candles coming out of the church and joining the citizens who had banners and, and would chant and they would march um, for change. They wanted you know, freedom of speech, freedom to travel, fair elections. Um, 
So Helena is drawn into this peaceful protest movement right about the time when police violence is just ramping up in the city. You know, the Stasi secret police are determined to crack down, just shut down these protests. Um, uh, eventually, though, as history tells us, uh, the demonstrations, which did remain peaceful, um, they managed to stay peaceful in the face of so much police violence, uh, and they came to a surprising and magnificent crescendo and ultimately brought about the fall of the wall. So, yeah, I just, when I dove into the research for it, it was so captivating. And Helena's story just became a story of hope and courage, of finding the, her voice, uh, and about the power of music. And for me, that's actually where it really started. Um, that was the spark that got me into the story was the power of music. Um, my husband and I, when we're reading, we'll often just share, you know, little bits and pieces that we're reading. And he shared a quote with me um, that was attributed to a senior Stasi official. And when asked um, why the Stasi didn't quash these protests like they did all the other protests going on in East Germany, uh, he reportedly said, we had no contingency plan for song. No contingency plan for song. And that was the phrase that just the idea of music as an act of resistance, um, that that fascinated me. And being a musician myself, you can see in my backdrop here, <laughs> um, uh, just knowing a little bit about uh, Bach's influence and history in Leipzig, that was sort of like sealed the deal for me uh, and um, made me want to tell the story, made me need to uh, tell this story. Um, so yeah, I dove into uh, the research, loved it. Um, and that that was um, sort of the last several months of 2019 was when I was very much immersed in the research. Uh, and then I drafted the book in the first half of 2020. Um, and there was, you know, research is perpetual. There was always something else I needed to learn, but um, mostly writing in, in the beginning of 2020 there. And you know, what really struck me um, as I wrote was that the themes that were emerging from 1989, lines in 2020. Uh, and they're still, of course, in the news here and now. And so, uh, yeah, I was just struck so much um, how it was all still so relevant. Um, you know, it's just, on one level, it's a story about a teenager who dares to dream. Um, but it's really about finding the courage to be a change maker. And we need that every bit as much now as, as we did behind the Iron Curtain. So that was what struck me the most when I was writing. Yeah. Anyway, that's Song of Freedom, Song of Dreams. Well, you had some really, um, you had some really interesting characters, and also the very opening scene when when she is expecting her close friend from kindergarten, I think, um, to meet her, and suddenly the friend was gone, and the family had moved out of town because people were apparently, from what you said in your book. Or maybe I read it after I did a little research on it too, and it said that uh, half of the commute, half of the people in Leipzig wanted to stay, but they wanted a change, and the other half just wanted to leave. And there were ways that these people were sneaking out, and her friend's family had done that, which left her bereft. And then, uh, and of course, as you said, they couldn't trust anyone, so. Then a young man came on the scene, which, of course, is going to be very intriguing for the age group that are reading this book. And uh, that was that was sort of nice, the way that you portrayed that. But I really loved it that you talked a little bit about her father, who was a teacher, and about how much he loved teaching. And he just would not let his students, he would not, you know, he absolutely would not um let them miss him. So he went no matter what. And having been a teacher for many years, I really appreciated that, you know, because oh, nice. we're not always yeah. portrayed as, you know, loving what we do, yeah. although most of us do. Well, I, I remember just reading about, yeah, some of the, the real life stories from, from the time. And 
I mean, people would, like you say, some some want to change, but they want to stay. Some want to stay, change, so they wanted to go. And people work for change in so many different ways, some through these marches, some through prayers. But others, like, I mean, her father was involved in, in the marches, but mm -hmm. um, that uh, those little acts of resistance, like daring to allow his students to think for themselves, mm -hmm. um, that was a very subversive action that could have landed him in prison. Um, you know, but people find their own voice, their own way of resisting, using whatever gifts and, and vision for change that they have. And um yeah, I guess that's still true today. We all have our ways of uh, uh, using who we are to work for positive change. Yeah. Um, here's something that I've wondered about, and this is a question for both of you. How did you decide the audience that you would write your, your books for? Well, I think in my case, um, it just sort of seems the the age level and the reading level that I've gravitated to in my writing career. Um, if you were to ask my wife, she would say it's it's because I still act like a twelve year old boy. Um, <laughs> but and she's not wrong. Um, but I just felt like the idea of that age group having you know, observations of, of what is this huge event that's taking place around them knowing, I mean, they know, they know the world is changing. They know the world is going to change. Their world is going to change and having them observe and report on what they see. I thought, I just found that uh, interesting. And I, I kind of was, wasn't sure, but uh, I don't, I wasn't sure that anything like this, especially at least about this topic, uh, had been done before, at least that I'm familiar with. Um, and that that was a, another intriguing thing to, to maybe uh, break some new ground uh, in in the storytelling. I think you're right. Uh, kids really love uh, reading about the Holocaust, interestingly. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. But this isn't, you know, this is something different. But yours is 8 to 12, isn't it? That's the age. Correct, right. Yeah. And now, right. Sherry, yours is 12 to 19. Yeah, this one, um, I, I also write middle grade. So I know I've just always, I was an avid reader as a kid. Um, and I think I've always believed in the, the power of children's books mm -hmm. um, and of kids of all ages, teens, kids being able to see themselves in books and just how important that is for building bridges, building empathy. Um, so I've always written for kids. Um, now with this story in particular, I knew that I... I wanted, I mean, to really be authentic, um, she had to be, that was the minimum age she, the character could kind of be to be involved in in these protests. There weren't um, a lot of teens. Like now, it seems to me so often it's the young people that are the change makers. You know, you look uh, in our world today, but um, research showed me that there really weren't too many uh, young people who were taking part in these protests. There were young adults, but not teens. So, um, yeah. So she really had to be uh, into her into her mid to upper teens to. Uh, and so to she was there. sixteen, and then Rolf in uh, Michael's book was twelve. Correct. So you could see the difference in the way each approached what was going on. Because Rolf was somewhat tentative and trying to figure out, you know, next steps and what to do and whom to talk to. And, you know, so, sure. Edward, you know, already knew. Right. What and was I mean, that, yeah. that's, you know, an age when you're just starting to try to figure out yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, who you are mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what type of person you want to be. And so I think it was just, to me, it was just really interesting to bring, uh, like I said, this huge geopolitical thing and put it in in the hands of these young people uh, and see how they respond to it. Well, you've both done a wonderful service to yeah. children's literature, and I appreciate that. And it was a pleasure for me to read both books. It was, I mean, you know, it was deeply concerning, but it was a, a pleasure. And right. I, I thank you for that. Yeah. But these... do you have any questions for each other? 
Uh, no, I just, I want to read the book now. Um, yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Michael, just the, the first one is out or is... Correct. The, okay. Correct. Yep. Yep. And, and do you uh, have a pub date for the next book yet? It's summer 25. That's great. So that's all I know. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. And, and there will be one every six months. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, you're going to be busy. Yeah. So... <laughs> Well, I guess in uh, the road to, to hell, I guess. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Thank you so much. And and we really thank all of the publishers or your two. No, do you have this? No, you don't have the same publisher. No. no. But we have their imprints, aren't they, for the same publisher? Aren't they, Elanita? No, Andrew Neal, um, it might be distributed by Simon, but no. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. And I expect Elanita has something that she'd like to end up with. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, Michael, and Sherry. Um, I don't know. The timing seems to be very interesting <laughs> to hear your books after uh, yesterday. Yeah. Um, sure. I was thinking of you all. <laughs> um, right. A big thank you to you, to uh, I love the um, I hate that we have to keep going through this in the world, but I love your stories and that you've taken the time to really embrace them and share them with us. Um, and we want to thank, obviously, your publishers and books are available to purchase from Broadart. So thank you again. And we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much.